God bless you. Turn with us in your Bibles to Psalms 123. We are going to spend <clears throat> this time of preaching and teaching together. Uh, continuing, I believe we've launched into a series on hope. And uh, this is a series of preaching and teaching that has come from our uh, pastoral and preaching teams. And I certainly want to appreciate uh, all of those who have continued to hold down uh, the ministry of the Way Church as I have uh, been on a bit of an assignment the last several months, um, you know, continuing to do the work of, of uh, activating our churches and many of us to the, to the polls. And so I just want to appreciate uh, Pastor Tanisha and Pastor Donna Battle and, and uh, Minister Mike and uh, Minister Adrian uh, and uh, Minister Wayne and uh, Minister Lauren and all those uh, who are literally helping to ensure that our church continues to operate uh, at a level of excellence and efficiency. Um, it's not lost upon me uh, that um, this busy season uh, and this coronavirus has certainly put a strain on many, if not all of us. Um, but our church continues to press on and we continue to press on. And I just want to appreciate all of you that continue to do the great work of helping us to accomplish um, this great ministry. And so as we uh, launch into this uh, preaching series, I hope that you uh, imagine and see God's hand at work in your life and in the life of all those whom you know and love. Uh, you were, uh, if you who were able to join last week uh, were uh, certainly made aware by me about uh, the challenge with my hearing and my, my, my ears and the ear infection that had kind of uh, gotten worse. And I just want to thank God that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm able to hear today, praise God, and uh, that's a blessing. And uh, I'm, I'm well enough to at least kind of get back into the preaching saddle. And so I definitely wanted uh, to make sure I uh, brought um, this message this morning as we continue um, to, to, to think very deeply about what does God require of us in this moment and in this season. So Psalms 123 is where we'll spend our time together. And so let's take a quick look at the biblical text and see what the Word of God speaks to us. This is the lectionary passage, and so we want um, to uh, sit ourselves down in um, the soil of this Word today. Um, you know, the book of Psalms, uh, some have wrote, uh, is uh, very different from the Gospels, where we find uh, the Gospel, uh, the good news of Jesus, is theology in search of experience, meaning that we are given these kinds of truths and these kinds of ideas, these witnesses uh, sharing what they have seen and heard. And they are in search, the gospel is, of an experience that can cause these truths to, in many respects, be made alive. That the gospel, the good news of Jesus, is always attempted to take root in our heart so we can, as a living, breathing epistle, as I think Peter says, a letter written by God to humanity, the gospel in search of experience. But uh, one writer uh, says that the Psalms is uh, experience in search of a theology, which is to say that sometimes there are moments in our lives where we don't have the theology worked out that matches our experience. That often you may encounter situations that what you learned in Sunday school and what you heard the preacher preach and what you uh, have thought the cliches uh, were uh, gospel your whole life don't necessarily fit that which you and I are experiencing. And this is the book of the Psalms where I find it to be particularly helpful because the Psalms often say things that we would not say. And uh, we're going to spend a few moments uh, kind of digging into that uh, on this morning. The scripture, Psalms 123, uh, says these words, unto you, O Lord, I lift up my eyes. You who are enthroned in the heavens, for as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a maid look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to you, Lord our God, until you have mercy on us. 
Verse number three, have mercy upon us, O Lord. Have mercy upon us, for we have had more than enough contempt of the proud. I don't know if you've prayed that prayer over the last several years, over the last several weeks, over the last several days or hours. God, I'm tired of the contempt of the proud. For our soul has had more than its fill of scorn of those who are at ease of the contempt of the proud. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Yes, we're going to spend uh, the time of preaching today just talking about uh, I've got my eyes on you. Come on, just say that with me. I've got my eyes eyes on you. This is, amen, the, the, the text and the preaching for us today. Let's pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for we who are your people, and we ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you, and please send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word, and we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen. Amen, amen. Come on, just put in the chat, I can't take my eyes off you. Amen. I can't take my eyes off you. Now, you know, I, I thought of this song uh, that was covered or, or, or re-recorded, if you will, by the great urban prophet uh, Lauren Hill, uh, you know, capturing the words that say, you're just too good to be true. I can't take my eyes off of you. You'd be like heaven to touch. And I want to hold you so much. At long last, love has arrived. And I thank God I'm alive. You're just too good to be true. And I can't take my eyes off of you. I don't know if you're like me. Uh, there's something powerful and amazing about uh, the gift of not just love, but surprises, the kinds of surprises that uh, make your heart grow long. And when, when, when you're out of the absence of that source of either the gift or love. And it is, I think, a wonderful and important part of how I hope to begin this sermon today with this basic question, where are your eyes? Where are your eyes? And none of us can take this question for granted because there are many things that seek to capture our gaze. The text starts off very clearly in the first verse and declares, the writer does, to you, O God, I lift up my eyes. This idea that our eyes are not necessarily trained on God consistently is a reality that you and I must come not only to grips with, but think deeply about how can we indeed make a commitment and a decision in this season that God, I will Keep my eyes on you. Where are your eyes in the moments of grief and death? Where are our eyes in the moments of loss and tragedy? Where are our eyes when COVID continues to literally rob us of time we will not get back? Where are our eyes in seasons of triumph when we experience uh, the, 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 the sweet taste of victory and progress? Where are our eyes in the aftermath of the political and social realities? Dare I say, where are our eyes as we go through the challenges we're facing today? Where are our eyes as we endure life's transitions? You know, I have continued to think deeply about hope in this season because 
For many of us who are dealing with the transitions of social, personal, political, religious, uh, psychological, economic, relational, all of these transitions can evoke a certain form of dread and anxiety that is human. So we are not attempting to problematize our human responses, but there is a powerful uh, kind of uh, 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 foundational principle of Christian faith, of we who follow Jesus, the Apostle Paul says it like this, that uh, we would not have you be ignorant, uh, dear loved ones, uh, of the, the, the kind of plight of those who die uh, before the return of the Lord. We do not want you to mourn as those who do not have hope. Right. And, and, and if I could expand the Apostle Paul's kind of, 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 of theorem there, that we are a people who even in our life's transitions uh, are not a people who should endure transitions as those who do not have hope. For hope is the dis, dis, differentiating factor between you and them between we who follow the ways of Jesus and those, as the scriptures say, do not have hope. And I want to ask you today, how well then do you carry your hope? How well do you sustain your hope? What are you and I doing to cultivate? our hope. Hope is uh, something that uh, has become quite trivialized in the last decade or so by the, 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 the kind of um, rising of the Obama presidency where he plucked hope into a and made it a political slogan of sorts. And, and many folk have, have evacuated the theological gifts of hope and replace them with a very temporal and insufficient political notion of hope. But I want you to appreciate, child of God, that there is a difference between the hope that you can uh, 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 believe in vis-a-vis -vis a political or human person and the hope that has been downloaded within us through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives through grace that brings salvation. I hope you understand what I'm saying today. First Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13 talks about uh, the, 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 the three kinds of things that remain at the end of it all. He says there is faith, love, and hope, and yet the greatest of these is love. Christian writers and theologians throughout history have elevated love, faith, and hope as theological virtues. And I'm going to get a little theological today because, you know, I haven't preached in a while, so I got a little bit of theology shut up in my bones. Praise God. But if you think of hope not as a political slogan or as a, 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 a sense of trust in something that is, is as temporal as you. If you see hope as something much more deep and so, so much more nuanced and so much more eternal, you would approach the power of hope as a theological virtue that serves to fuel you and I through the transitions that you and I are likely to face. A virtue, let's start there, is described as an abiding habit that allows you and I to do that which is good. Theologically speaking, a virtue uh, has both natural and supernatural kinds of categories. Uh, the natural virtues are those things that are good acts that you can practice as you continue to repeat those good practices over time. 
uh, studying for your test is a good uh, natural virtue. Eating healthy is a good natural virtue. Getting exercise is a good natural virtue. I'm preaching to myself. I hope you catch up. Somebody say amen, right? Natural virtues. But then there are also supernatural virtues that are only gifted to you and I by God. And these supernatural virtues are habits that God works in and through us that helps us to continue to do things that are not just pleasing to God, but that help you and I have a life that is abundant even when circumstances are restricted. Theological virtues, they have God as their motive and the objects are faith, hope and charity. The, the virtues that help you and I continue to be shaped after the ways of God. These virtues produce fruit in us that cannot be diminished by the external circumstances that we are likely to face throughout the course of our journey. And so the question for you and I, as we begin this conversation about hope, is what must I do to cultivate the theological virtues, faith, love, and hope, particularly in this moment, the love and the faith that produces hope worked out in us is done through acts of prayer and good works made available to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope you appreciate what I'm trying to, to kind of open up for us as a precondition for hope, as a as a seed of sorts in our spirit that you and I can hope for the 49ers to win. We can hope for the Raiders to win. We can hope for the Warriors to get back on the winning track. But those outcomes are greatly dependent on human uh, uh, excellence, human practices. But I want you to know there is a hope that lives within the life of the believer. Jesus has given us, the scripture says, the hope of glory inside. And the hope of glory inside of us, child of God, it won't let you go. Lord, help me in here today. I, I, I want you to think about uh, the, what is at stake for you and I that there is a hope inside of you that God won't allow to let go of you that even when you attempt to untether yourself from hope the hope that is within you made present by the spirit won't allow you to be let go. Uh, hope is like the, 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 the leash that God keeps on you to make sure you don't get too far out there. Hope is the ability for you to uh, have the eyes to see beyond your circumstance. Hope frees you from the intolerable burden of thinking that so much depends on us, uh, robbing us of the ability to see the blessings that are around us. Hope Hope gives you a well of gratitude where you can wake up every day and draw from the, the wells of hope that lead to abundant life through kindness and goodness to others. Hope plants seeds in the soil of the Christ follower's heart and produces a harvest of joy and thanksgiving. Hope is a seed that produces service and generosity hope is a seed that creates hospitality and celebration and listen to this hope is that which keeps you from being burdened or bound by the fear of failure why because if I have hope, I know that even though my life may have challenge and trial, hope 
keeps me aware that God's yes will always override my no's. Oh, you ought to just put that in the chat and say God's yes will always override my no's, my failures, my missteps. God's yes will always produce the fruit of possibility. Hope then is a state of not being based on circumstance, even though at times it may feel more concrete than others, hope is the reality that there's always possibility working within us and around us and dare I say beyond us. But it's always important to know that hope is not sustained or made concrete by our individual achievements. So hope is not that which you can do by yourself. Communities cultivate hope. Individuals may benefit from it, but we as God's people make hope filled investments that reap, cause us to reap hopeful results. We do not hope alone. Even while we are enduring the pandemic, we do not hope alone. Even though we can't meet in person, we are not hoping alone. Even though we have to mediate our conversations and our studies and, and our prayer groups through Zooms and StreamYards and Facebook Lives, we still are not alone. For hope is cultivated by our togetherness. Hope requires companions. People who want our good and people who are willing to help us along the way. And this leads me then to the second point. If the first point is that hope is that which causes you and I to get on this road towards keeping our eyes on the Lord. Uh huh. Then hope. The second point I'll lift up is the idea that hope travels well. Uh, somebody holler hope travels well. Yes, uh, in, in the text, I, I also appreciate that the, the larger genre of the text is one uh, that is called a psalm of ascent, A-S-C-E-N-T, which means that the, the, the children of Israel or those who were making their annual pilgrimages to Jerusalem or to the temple, they had songs and they had uh, chants and they had words and prayers that they would read and sing and chant and pray along the journey. And the Psalm of Ascent, as they are ascending to the place they know God is, to that place of hope, that concretized hope place that is in the tabernacle or in the temple, if you will, they know that they're on a journey, a routine journey to a place where hope is concretely dwelling. And I want you to know, child of God, that hope travels well among those who are the right travelers. Yes, Yes, yes. Uh, hope travels well among those who are the right travelers. As the pilgrims or the sojourners or the travelers made their trips to Jerusalem, they understood that who I'm traveling with matters. Who I'm carrying along with me on this journey matters. And, and it is so fascinating that even right now, as our country is attempting to kind of right itself or, or at least kind of get itself back on stronger footing, that there is a quick move by some to assume that everybody in this country wants to travel in the same direction. I'm here to tell you that who you are traveling with will very much determine the depth and the sustainability of the hope that is lying within you. It won't go away, but it may not be cultivated well. And you and I must then guard ourselves, Lord help me in here today, from attaching ourselves too quickly 
to people who have demonstrated their inability to be good travel partners as we make our journey to the concrete hope that we have before us as an assignment from God. People talk about forgiveness and reconciliation and they're asking folks to, to kind of jump back into relationships with folks who even right now are, are attempting to, to engage in destabilizing activity in a already fragile country. Folk want to talk about forgiveness and reconciliation with wicked while they are still engaged in their wickedness. Huh, I want you to know that we are not required to forgive or reconcile with the wicked until they ask for forgiveness followed with repentance. Lord, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a ruffle some feathers for a few moments, but that's okay. I, I want to lift it up to you because there's some of us who have been taught a version of Christianity that makes you welcome the abuser back into your home. Welcome the person that means no good back into your safe space. Uh, they live in your head paying rent. They live in your space and they occupy territory that is not there to dwell in but I want you to know that that is not the total witness of scripture I know some of us can pluck a few scriptures out and make some of this make sense but let me just give you a little bit of a counterbalance somebody say counterbalance Jesus did not go into the temple and see the wrongdoing and said I must forgive all you folk cheating the people in the temple Jesus did not go in there and attack inside with everybody in there who were who were exploiting the poor in the house of God. No, Jesus found some kind of holy rage, if you will. And the scripture says he turned some tables over. He uh -huh, cleaned out the temple. I want you to know that is very dense uh, than the kind of forgiveness and reconciliation you trying to tell me you and I must be engaged in uh, while the wicked continue to act wickedly. Uh, uh, can I give you a couple more examples? Uh, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 verse 49 that I've come to bring fire on the earth uh, and how I wish it were already a blazing uh, he said don't think I come to bring peace on earth no I tell you I've come to bring division uh, from now on there will be five in one family divided against each other three against two and two against three they will be divided father against son and son against father mother against daughter daughter against mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law why because Jesus understands uh, that sometimes you can't be united uh, with people who mean you harm. Uh, it don't mean you got to take them physically out, uh, but it may mean you need to give them a pink slip. Lord, help me in here today. Jesus called the religious and legal leaders of his day vipers. He called them snakes. He called them white tombs. Lord, I wish I could talk to you today. Don't cuss them out next time you get mad. Just tell them I'm going to call you what Jesus called you. You ain't nothing but a snake. You ain't, I dare you, just as we call somebody, you ain't nothing but a tomb, but just a grave graveyard a place where dead bones dwell uh, they gonna look, look at you trying to did you just cuss me out in, with the holy ghost tongue uh, you can tell them i just described you the way jesus would <laughs> somebody shout hallelujah if you want to talk about forgiveness, uh, Jesus uh, 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 get forgave generously the humble. Jesus generously extended grace to the hurting and the vulnerable, those without power and privilege uh, who knew they needed a savior. And I'm here to tell you that you and I must not let the powerful and the wicked pervert forgiveness and reconciliation into a tool to absolve 
them of accountability. Yeah. No, no, no. The devil is a lie. Stop killing people. How about that? Uh, stop locking people in cages. How about that? Uh, stop exploiting people and, and stop destabilizing an already fragile country. Yeah. If you want forgiveness and reconciliation, if you want to walk this journey and help me cultivate some hope, uh, then repent, uh, as the scripture says. Uh, say you are sorry. Yeah. Make a 100 an 80 degree turn uh, then we can talk about forgiveness and reconciliation i got bible for it i got bible for it uh, luke 17 verse 3 and 4 says it like this if your brother sins rebuke them and if if somebody say if uh, you ought to put that in the chat if put it in bold uh, capitalize it uh, if is a conditional word uh, and if they repent forgive them now listen uh, if they sin against you seven times in a day and turns to you saying I repent you must forgive them uh, so Jesus gives you this caveat uh, he says listen forgiveness uh, is only required when somebody repents and asks for forgiveness. So I want you, child of God, to guard your forgiveness. Guard your reconciliation. Don't throw it away out there to the pearl, to the swine. There are enough people in your life to practice forgiveness with who are willing to ask for forgiveness with repentance than for you to go out here trying to reconcile with people who will knock you upside the head and not even say they're sorry. Uh, Lord, I don't know why I went on that rant today, uh, but it's, it's, it's the truth anyhow. Uh, hope travels as a companion in your life, uh, not as a provocateur. Uh, hope helps you to move through stages of your life with a clarity of what is possible. Uh, hope does not travel as a provocateur provoking you back to trauma and back to harm and back to bad works. Uh, that's why I ask God, Lord, help me to have good travel companions. Uh, help me to have people who I can travel with uh, that will bring the best out in me. Uh, that will pray for me that will speak life to me that will remind me that as the old saints used to sing a song trouble won't last always uh, do i have anybody that believes that today that trouble won't last always uh, somebody shout hallelujah now understand child of god that there is also a use for hope that travels uh, but hope also endures uh, verse number two says it powerfully that until god has mercy on us uh, i want you to know that the struggle is real uh, but listen child of god not all struggles are equal you may be dealing with struggle, but not every struggle you endure is equal. You must have the ability to categorize your struggles uh, and then attend or respond to your struggles uh, with the right kind of theological virtue called hope. Uh huh. I'm not speaking about oppression Olympics. Uh, I'm not speaking about a hierarchy of 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 trouble or or or, or challenge. Uh, but I'm talking about differentiation. Uh, differentiation need not necessitate hierarchies. Uh, differentiation just means that there are certain things that require certain descriptions uh, in order to give a full account of my reality. And I can can look in my own life and, and, and I've had to I've had to take a look at the kinds of things I need hope for. I've needed hope to respond to the existential threats that are imminent but unable to be solved by my own power. Those kind of threats are things like Donald Trump. Somebody say amen. And thank God we have 70 some million folk helping us to respond to that kind of existential threat. Climate change, an existential threat. You can't, we can't solve it individually. Capital 
capitalism and the, the treatment of the poor, the unhoused loved ones around us, an existential threat. Uh, but we cannot solve it by ourselves. Uh, uh, differentiation causes me to know that I must endure personal challenges. Uh, those things that are unique to my experience. Uh, death and sickness and illness uh, and childhood trauma personal threats all of us have personal threats personal challenges uh, though they may be familiar or similar to others they are still very unique to you and then uh, we have ongoing threats or challenges uh, and these things i like to describe as those uh, that are related to our social location uh, racism oppression inequities uh, bills lord have mercy school lord have mercy job and works uh, lord have mercy things that are ongoing i i want you to know that all of these kinds of categorized differentiated uh, uh, kinds of struggles are real but the hope that lives within is able to attend to each and every one of them particularly and what I love about God is that there are times in our lives where God will at each moment we need him give us one of those divine winks that God just is reminding you I have not forgotten about you anybody ever had one of those real struggles uh, those existential those personal or those ongoing and you felt like things were, were getting out of your grasp but all of a sudden a little sunshine broke through the clouds a little reprieve broke into your consciousness I want you to know that's God winking at you that's God just telling you that I am still here not just with you but I am here within you and just like the pilgrims the sojourners and the travelers had to travel travel to Jerusalem and lift up their voice and keep their eyes focused on the hope that was the destination of the temple I hear God telling you and I keep your eyes on me you're gonna go through some valleys on the way to the temple but keep your eyes on me you're gonna go through some rough places on your way to heaven but keep your eyes on me how do I keep my eyes uh, on the destination when I have obstacles uh, in front of uh, my way uh, well hope is that which allows you and I uh, to see the trajectory of possibility uh, beyond the dead end moments of our lives uh, hope is that which allows you to have the 3d glass effect uh, without the glasses you can see everything that's happening although Oh, you can see some things uh, but hope is like 3d glasses uh, you put them on and that which feels mundane uh, it begins to come alive uh, Lord I feel like preaching in here today uh, somebody holler hope lets me come alive uh, hope gives me the ability to imagine uh, to see those things that are not uh, as though they already are uh, and I love how hope helps me to have a vision beyond that which I can only see with my own physical senses uh, I love in the text how hope is used uh, as a metaphor as a poem uh, the writer says as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master and as the eyes of a maid uh, look to the hand of her mistress uh, so our eyes look to the Lord our God uh, I love how the writer makes it very intentional uh, through the literary use of poetry uh, that sometimes you got to use the arts uh, and you got to use beauty uh, you got to use descriptions uh, that help expand your imagination uh, I want 
you to know that there's a place in your life as you go through your trial uh, for beauty and art and aesthetics. Uh, there's a place in your life uh, where hope can be nurtured uh, through the regular engagement uh, of that creation uh, that God has gifted to us. Uh, rather than getting bogged down in all the ugliness, uh, all the depression, uh, all the negativity, uh, all the questions that are real uh, the struggle that is for real uh, i hear the writer giving you and i a blueprint that is telling us uh, i refuse to let my conditions uh, be the limitation of how i describe my life uh, lord help me help me help me uh, the writer says uh, that i'm gonna find beauty in the ugliness uh, that is around me uh, i'm gonna look up Lord, I wish somebody right now, even in your house, uh, just look up. Uh, I dare you to get real bold and walk to your door, uh, walk to your window, uh, and just take a peek up uh, and look at the expanse uh, of what God has created. Uh, look at how God is taking care of everything all at the same time. Uh, look to the water and see what God is able to do. Uh, look to the stars and see what God is able to sustain. Visit some museums and look at the beauty that pours out of the life of fallen humanity. Read some poetry. Listen to some good music. Oh, but attend to the part of your constitution that is animated by the ethereal and the imagination. What are you trying to say? Hey, Pastor Mike, I'm trying to tell you that hope knows how to imagine. Uh, hope has the power to help you imagine a world uh, beyond your limitations. Uh, so cultivate that hope uh, by getting an imagination. Uh, as my comrade Michael Ray Matthews says, uh, that if you don't develop your own imagination, uh, you are living inside somebody else's imagination. Uh, and I refuse to live in your head uh, when God wants me to live in the expanse of his creation. Somebody shout hallelujah. So child of God, find you a song. Find you some, some, some beauty. Find you some aesthetics. Find you something that helps you imagine a different reality. Because when you can see the light, when you can see the bright side, when you can see the possibility, I believe you're going to keep moving forward. I believe you're going to keep walking. I believe you're going to keep putting one step in front of the other. I love how the old uh, my aunt used to sing a song. She used to sing a song and it went like this. Trials come on every hand. When you try to do what's right. Though we do the best we can. Always it seldom feels right. But I am glad that Jesus knows just how much we can bear. So don't you give up and don't you give in because there's a bright side somewhere. Then she used to go into it and said, there's a bright side somewhere. There's a bright side somewhere. Don't you give up and don't you give in. Just keep your head up and keep believing there's a bright side somewhere. I know some of us are going through hell right now. I know even on the whims and on the 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 the, the, the wings or, or the tail end of this election, some of us are still filled with despair and worrisome. But I want you to know there's a light that is shining and it's being empowered by the power of the hope within. As a child of God, I want you to 
tap into the hope uh, the hope that helps you to endure uh, the hope that keeps your eyes uh, on the Lord uh, and the hope that helps you to imagine uh, that there's a bright side uh, somewhere uh, somebody shout hallelujah there's a bright side there's a hopeful side there are practices there are imaginations there are companions that are required to cultivate the theological hope the hope categorized and described by the theological virtues of our faith and I want you to know, child of God, that that hope is within your grasp. It's not just within your grasp. As the ancient theologian said, all who are in the state of grace have within them the virtues of love, faith, and hope. That these things are within us. See yourself, your life, your mind, your spirit as soil that God has planted these virtues in. These virtues don't go away because we may walk away. But these virtues are waiting for the cultivation, the cultivation of practices, of sojourners, of imagination that can help produce a harvest to sustain us through these difficult seasons. Oh, I want you to know that hope is often trivialized, but as I've been reading and praying and thinking about this sermon series, it's brought back to me the richness of the possibility of hope. That hope does not make us ashamed, but it is spread in our hearts through Christ Jesus. Child of God, cultivate some hope this week. Every day you wake up, I want you to find you some hope. Look up, look outside and say, I can't take my eyes off of you, hope. Visit a museum, walk along the marina. Go outside on your deck or on your porch or on your stoop and look up into the heavens and let hope be animated by the power of God. But whatever you do, don't let hopelessness grip your heart for hopelessness can be as deadly as a bullet. But the hope within can produce a harvest you will never have room to hold. God, I pray for the people of the way. I pray for the transitions many of us are enduring. Transitions, Lord God, that are accompanied with grief and challenge and questions. I pray, God, that as we make these transitions, as we move from political administrations to political administrations from life to death, from sickness to wellness back to sickness, from strained relationships to whole relationships, from financial challenges to some stability. God, all these transitions need hope to fuel us so we don't lose our eyes being fixated on you. God, I know that the prerequisite for this hope I'm speaking of is found in right relationship with you. So God, I pray right now for every person under the sound of my voice who is not yet in relationship with you, the living God. I pray even right now, God, that you would, through the power of your spirit, beckon them to come. Beckon them 
to make a decision today that I will follow Jesus. I have decided to make Jesus my choice. For in choosing Jesus, I release the seeds of these virtues, love, faith, and hope that together can withstand every circumstance. So if you're here today and you're listening, and you're saying, I don't know about this Jesus beyond the social justice warrior, beyond the organizer, beyond the, the great teacher. I'm here to tell you there is a Jesus you have not yet met that can do more than just set the unrighteousness of the world straight, but can also correct and reorder our hearts into a right relationship with God. Just say yes to this Jesus. And in saying yes, you unleash the virtues, the theological virtues, the gifts, the salvation of the Lord into your life. I pray God for every person who is enduring these seasons of difficulties and transitions. I pray, Lord, that as we endure them, your hope will sprout up within us. May our eyes be focused on you, God, in our triumphs, in our defeats, in our ups, in our downs. As we endure another season of coronavirus, as it's taking an upward trend, I pray, God, that hope, wisdom, sound thinking, truth, Lord God, will prevail in our lives. And may we humble ourselves enough to follow it to lessen the impact of this scourge that still is in our land. And God will say, thank you, Lord. We'll say thank you, Lord. Just take a few moments and lift your hands one more time right where you are. God, I receive the hope of the Lord. I receive the hope that brings peace. I receive the hope that fuels. I receive the hope that liberates. I receive the hope. May it be for me that, Lord God, which is unintelligible, which is, Lord God, that unable to be spoken. And I'll and will say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Oh, the people of the way, come on and just thank the Lord for hope. Thank the Lord that we can't keep our eyes off of you, Lord. For that is where hope and the bright side, that's where it dwells. Be encouraged, people of the way. Hope is within us and it will never be lost. God bless you, God bless you.